Welcome. On behalf of uh, Radboud Reflex and the Faculty of Law of the Radboud University, I welcome you to this evening about anti-democratic polit politics and the rule of law. Um, my name is Kees Leijners and I'm, go I'm the host of tonight. Um, we think, or maybe I should say, we used to think that the European Union, European community, um, is a set of states that are governed by the rule of law. Are they still? Is this concept of the rule of law actually under threat of regimes that have autocratic traits and that maybe are actually threatening the rule of law? What is the rule of law? And what is the relation between the rule of law and democracy? Um, and is democracy under threat? Is it under threat in the rest of Europe? Is it possibly under threat here? And what about the the contradictory the, 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 the contradictory principle that a democracy can actually give birth to anti-democratic regimes? What about it? How does it work? How can we possibly counter it? These are the questions we're going to deal with uh, tonight, and uh, we have two excellent speakers for you who are going to deal with all these. Um, issues. To begin with Petra Baart, uh, she's a professor of sus sustainable rule of law um, at uh, the Faculty of Law uh, here at Radboud University, and Joop van Nitt, who is a PhD candidate who works on democratic backsliding sliding as an empirical political scientist, also here at Radboud University. Petra will kick off, jo <coughs> Joop will uh, follow, then we'll have a discussion with the three of us, and then we will we'll actually take the questions of you as um, the audience. I hope you will enjoy this evening, and I give the floor to Petra Baart. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. Um, I will immediately jump into uh, today's topics. I, I want to address three issues today. The one being the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights that we will talk about, what it is. Uh, the second being value violations across the European Union. And the third is what the European Union can do about them and what you can do about value violations as European citizens. Uh, so first, let, uh, let me say a few words about the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. And I really promise, despite being a lawyer, I won't list laws, neither regulations, directives, and, and, and provisions, especially not with number. But uh, excuse me for once referring to Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. This really captures the essence of what the European Union is. Article 1, it doesn't say anything. It says, hi, this is the European Union Treaty. Article 2 really tells you that the European Union is a peace project. It's about uh, pluralism, tolerance, justice, solidarity, equality, and so on and so forth. But there are three overarching principles that are there in all policies and laws uh, behind uh, European integration. And these are the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. Now, you will more talk about democracy, I will more talk about the rule of law, um, and then we will also add fundamental rights. There is a tendency these days to translate everything into the rights language. We have the right to uh, the, of, of future generations, the right to security, the right to uh, whatever, you, what, whatever it makes you happy uh, in life. But um, I, I very much try to resist this phenomenon. Not everything can be translated into the rights language, even though the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights are closely interrelated. So we will talk about very similar topics today. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Democracy without the rule of law and fundamental rights might turn into the dictatorship of the majority. Uh, think about, for example, judicial independence. It's really the core essence of the rule of law. Without independent courts, there is no person, there is no entity that can grant you your rights. So they are, it's closely interrelated with fundamental rights. Or think about democracy. 
democracy, especially the liberative democracy, can only function if we can conduct meaningful debates about public affairs. And we can only conduct meaningful debates if we have access to information. Again, another fundamental right is being respected. Uh, otherwise, uh, you are left with, um, with guesses, with paranoia, with tweets, with Facebook. Then you don't, if you don't have access to government information, or if you don't have access, for example, to research results. So that's why, and I perhaps should emphasize this in this uh, building, academic freedom is not respected. So, uh, we have these interrelated values um, that, um, as, as, as Jürgen Habermas previously said, and more recently Sergio Carrera and, and, and his co-authors mentioned and emphasized this in relation to the European Union. But what is the rule of law, uh, the value that I focus on? And here I brought you a definition. We don't have to read through it, but it's like legality, transparency, accountable, pluralistic lawmaking. It's, um, it's, it's independent judges. It's um, fundamental rights, uh, access to justice, separation of powers, equality before the law. Now, I could have taken many other examples and, and, and lists of what uh, the rule of law entails. It was a very deliberate choice by me to take this one because this is actually a quote from a European Union piece of law. So especially illiberal governments, uh, those who violate the rule of law, they tend to say that the rule of law is something that you cannot capture, it cannot be defined. It's, it's, it's such an elusive concept. Now it's not. We do have a definition of the rule of law and we have a hard law that needs to be enforced in the European Union. It's another thing that the rule of law can be achieved in multiple ways. Martin Krigier, who talks about tempering power, which I will uh, address in a minute, tends to say that it's like a do-it-your who goes to a hardware store and no one wants to buy a Black & Decker in a, in a hardware store. Everyone wants to hang a picture on the wall. It doesn't, doesn't matter how but the picture should be hung on the wall. It's the same thing with the rule of law. It can be achieved in many different ways. Finland, for example, doesn't have a constitutional court. It doesn't mean that there is no constitutional review in Finland. It doesn't mean that Finland is not a liberal democracy. You can achieve a rule of law state this or that way. Now, I, I also mention Martin Krigier because he's the person who uh, emphasizes one uh, specific aspect of the rule of law, and this is the following. It should temper power. Power is not terrible in and of itself. Power is important to realize many, many things. For example, security. The state has the power of coercion in criminal law. Without the state power of coercion, we would all engage in self-help. We would all engage in, um, in, in, in violence ourselves. So we give the power, the, uh, uh, the state, the power of coercion. But this power of coercion should be exercised in a legitimate way, and the state power of coercion should be limited. That is what the rule of law is about. For example, there shouldn't be any crimi uh, criminal uh, convictions without laws. There shouldn't be any cr criminal convictions without independent judges. The criminal sanctions shouldn't be inhuman, and so on and so forth. This is what he is talking about. Now, despite the fact that we have quite a clear vision of what the rule of law is, in a number of member states today, we have very serious value violations. And these value violations, they follow a very specific blueprint. It's called the autocrat's blueprint. And what we see is that the first entity to be captured is almost always the judiciary, especially the constitutional court um, in, in these countries. Then other state institutions are also being captured, whether it's the public prosecutor's office, election board, ombudsman, uh, central bank, and so on. Then there is a, a limitation of government criticism, whether it's a shrinking space for civil society, a, a very, very typical uh, limitation of rights, or whether it's a limitation of academic freedom or freedom of the art. 
we see um, media capture. So today's authoritarianism doesn't really work like a 20th century dictatorship. It's less direct censorship, for example, but it's more flooding the people with government propaganda. Uh, that's, that's the way to infuse people with, with this information. So, for example, you have a not so imaginary country, and maybe I should have started with a disclaimer, my country of origin is Hungary, so I make lots of references to Hungary uh, for the sole reason that this is the jurisdiction I know the best, but also it's a nice illustration of what I'm saying. Uh, so you have captured uh, television, you have a television uh, which uh, um, transmits government media. You don't have any channels which, uh, which, which give you uh, balanced information. You have radio which transmits government propaganda. You have free newspapers distributed to every household which gives you the same messages. And you have billboard campaigns wherever you go on the streets, if you just leave your house, you will see the very same messages again. So there is no need to censor uh, information because anyway, this flood of information of government propaganda will trump everything else. Um, then you have um, um, typically uh, repression of unfavored group. This is, this is the essence of populism. Whether these are traditionally unfavored groups, whether the LGBTI plus community or the Roma people or prisoners, but also there are new groups. For, so for example, in my home country, all of a sudden those women who gave birth in their homes became, uh, became enemies or anyone who turned to the Strasbourg court or the Luxembourg court just because they made use of their rights, they became traitors of the nation. Um, then there is another characteristic, which is using and abusing emergencies, whether it's a, if, if it's a pandemic or it's a war situation. It gives a, a, a possibility for the government to push through its agenda. Uh, I will give you a very uh, clear example. When uh, COVID hit Hungary, um, a new emergency law was adopted on the basis of which people who underwent gender reassignment couldn't have their new gender registered uh, in their IDs. I just can't phantom how this is related to the fight of the pandemic. Uh, it clearly isn't. Um, and then uh, the, uh, a very important segment is the distortion of election laws. And I left it last because this is closely connected uh, to democracy. Uh, but also to the rule of law. Even according to the thinnest definition of the rule of law in the literature, there need to be free and fair elections in which the governments can be changed. If, this, if that's not there, you can't talk about the rule of law and definitely you can't talk about democracy. Now, according to the OECD, so that's not me saying, that's an international organization saying, for the third time in a row it happened that Hungary had free elections which weren't fair at the same time anymore, for various reasons that I'm not going into, but I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Now, of course, all 27 member states do have systemic, do have uh, rule of law violations. Um, no state is immune from that, but here we are talking with regard to some member states' systemic rule of law violations, where there are governmental blueprints to entrench the power of the dominant party. That's the sole idea behind all policies and all legislations. Now, everything that I said so far is an EU matter. Why is it an EU matter? First of all, imagine that there are no free elections or no fair elections in one country. Uh, that, that means that members of the European Parliament will be sent in unfair elections to the European Parliament. These people will sit there and will vote on European legislation. Every single European piece of legislation will be delegitimized by these people. So this is a European matter. Uh, but also um, there are certain laws, legal instruments, which are based on the presumption that every member state is a state based on the rule of law. If we share a piece of criminal data, for example, with another member state, that won't be abused to oppress political opponents, but it'll will be used in a proper way just for the sake of the criminal proceedings. Now, if it's not true, then data will not be shared. And this is the end of EU law as we know it. Uh, but also, and I just give you the, uh, the picture with the um, basket with the rotten apple, rule of law violations become contagious. 
And we do see that illiberal governments learn from each other and they actually use very often the same tactics. So it should come as a surprise that despite these grave dangers for the European project, uh, project and the European idea, um, the European institutions fail to meaningfully step up against these violations. And it happened for a number of reasons that I will briefly go into. The prime reason being that no country in, the, in this part of the world would openly defy the dictates of the rule of law. No country, including the liberal countries, say, well, we, we are happily, we are proud of violating the rule of law. No, what they say is that they do adhere to the rule of law, but it's a different kind of a rule of law. Um, and this should be respected. Also, they use a lot of tactics. Sometimes they just deny that anything wrong happens. Sometimes they use deception. My favorite example, and sorry for my colleagues who know this example, is when the Hungarian government adopted a new constitution, which was not very minority friendly, and they sent the wrong translation of the fundamental law to Brussels. And then some human rights NGOs pointed out that the Hungarian text says something entirely different. Um, okay, so sometimes it's just blatant lies, right? Uh, sometimes it's a more sophisticated method uh, referring to national sovereignty, national security, constitutional identity. But in the end, these arguments are being abused in order to give a carte blanche authorization to the government basically to override what European Union law says. Okay, so teach, uh, cheating is the first um, uh, problem. The second is category errors. It's very visible, for example, in the annual rule of law report of the Commission, which is an annual scrutiny of the rule of law in the EU. And what they emphasize is the equal treatment of the member state, which is indeed a very important value. But we know since Aristotle that the same situations have to be treated in the same manner, and different situations needed to be treated differently. So you cannot use the same benchmarks vis-a-vis -vis democracies and autocracies. I will give you a very simple example. One thing that the Commission scrutinizes is whether court judgments are digitalized. It's very, very important for the transparency of court judgments. But it's even more important to have independent courts. If you don't have independent courts, but the judgments of the kangaroo courts are being digitalized, that's not a huge virtue. Right? Uh, or take the media authority. Um, one thing that they check is whether it's well financed. But if your media authority is the main responsible for distributing government propaganda, then is it really a virtue to finance it well? Okay, so this is, this is the problem with the different uh, benchmarks. Um, and I would uh, also highlight a, a, an argument that is being used by, uh, by European institutions uh, when they are blamed for failing to step up, and this is the lack of legal tools. We, no one envisioned at the beginning, uh, in the 1950s, uh, that a member state would take a U-turn towards authoritarianism. We don't have the tools to do anything. No member state can be... Uh, kicked out of the European Union, which, by the way, is true. But we have many, many tools to address rule of law backsliding. We have Article 723, uh, which has never, ever been used in the history of European integration, only 7-1 vis-a-vis uh, Poland and Hungary, but this is just a preliminary procedure. Uh, the real sanctioning procedure is in 7-2 and 3, uh, on the basis of which even the voting rights in the Council could be uh, taken away, it has never been even triggered. Then there are infringement proceedings. As my colleagues have shown, there is a decline in infringement proceedings. These are the proceedings that are started by the Commission in an ideal case if a member state violates European Union law. There is a decline in these uh, procedures and what is more, there are very few infringement ca uh, cases with a rule of law element. And finally, uh, there is the power of the purse. So the distribution of EU money could be connected to uh, respect for the rule of law. This is an, these are instruments that are currently being tested. So instead of using these tools, the European Union 
entered into a phase of tool creation. Uh, it created more and more mainly monitoring tools, uh, giving the pretense that it's doing something, whereas it basically becomes a bystander to rule of law violations across Europe. Uh, Daniel Kellerman uh, compares the European Union to a Ruth Goldberg machine. This is the machine which is totally useless, so we have totally useless rule of law procedures, new and new procedures that don't change the situation on the ground, that they give the semblance that something important is happening. Um, so as John Moran, another um, Dutch legal scholar, um, tends to say, it's not that we have too few instruments, it's only that we use them in a too late and too little fashion in the European Union. And finally, I, I wrote you a um, Hungarian cartoon. This is a very recent happening. Uh, you know that some uh, funds have been suspended vis-a-vis -vis Hungary for violations of the rule of law and judicial independence uh, in particular. Um, and some of these funds now have been released. Um, the European institutions argue that it happened because now Hungary adopted laws that finally make sure that judicial independence is respected. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look at these laws and the way they are applied, it's very far from the truth. Much rather, what happens is that in the European Union, we needed unanimity in order to start accession talks uh, with Ukraine. And the Hungarian prime minister vetoed these accession talks. Uh, unless the money is released. So the money was released and um, still the Hungarian Prime Minister refused to vote in favor of Ukraine's accession. So the German uh, Chancellor, Mr. Scholz said, Mr. Orban, why don't you take our money, EU money, and leave the room and grab a cup of coffee? And this is what eventually happened. Mr. Orban left the room and the other 26 member states uh, eventually agreed on starting accession talks. I won't have the time to go through uh, the details of this slide, but I'm very happy to mention them during the discussion. Uh, so, um, so as to show you how political compromises unfortunately overwrite uh, adherence uh, to the values such as the rule of law, democracy and fundamental rights. So what do we do after almost 15 years of backsliding in the European Union, which is getting better at some parts of the world, uh, notably in Poland, and which is getting worse in some parts of the world, notably Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, uh, you name them. And by the way, not just Central Eastern European countries, in the past year, uh, from 2022 to 2023, 14 member states deteriorated with regard to the rule of law. And uh, I think you will uh, talk a little more about uh, what is actually happening in this country. Uh, but what we, what we see happening, because the European Union institutions don't seem to contain rule of law backsliding, so instead they are contemplating, they are brainstorming about the idea of a two-tier Europe, you can't kick out any problematic member state of the European Union, but you can just sideline them. And this is what is eventually happening. For example, Hungary is not getting Erasmus funds. It's not participating in the European Public Prosecutor's Office upon its own initiative. So it's already not part of core Europe. And now there are talks to eventually institutionalize such a multi-speed two-tier Europe with first uh, with, uh, with first degree member states, so to say, and, 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 and some second uh, degree member states. And what these uh, illiberal examples are also used for, uh, instead of stepping up against them uh, in a dissuasive manner, they are very often used as case studies in democratic countries. Would our country, would this country survive a similar threat against the rule of law as what happened in Hungary or Poland. Is our democracy resilient enough? And the floor is yours. <laughs> 
Yes. Hi. Um, tonight we're talking about pretty big questions, pretty big themes, pretty big debates, both in science and in society. And I figured I've got about 20 minutes in a mini lecture, so I can just ask another big question. And the question is pretty simple. Is Dutch democracy under threat? Now, here's the problem we've got to deal with. Um, I'm an academic. I don't do simple answers, even to simple questions. So instead of just giving you a yes or a no and spoil the next 20 minutes for you, uh, we're going to ask three questions about autocratization, three questions about anti-democratic politics. Okay. And these three questions are the following. Our first question must surely be, okay, let's define anti-democratic politics. Let's define autocratization. And some expectation management here. Um, the theory, the big scientific debate about this, is not settled. And will only scratch the surface. But please bear with me a little bit, because in our second part, what is happening in Europe, I hope to give some anecdotes, some examples uh, of what is happening in Europe, uh, to see if we can learn from that. Because I think only if we've discussed what's happening elsewhere, and what anti-democratic politics actually are, can we apply it to the Netherlands. See what's similar? see what's different, and see what we can learn from it. So, with that itinerary and expectation management out of the way, um, let's start with question one. What are anti-democratic anti politics? Um, if we talk about anti-democratic po politics, we have to talk about democracy. Because the simple answer to what are anti-democratic politics is, of course, any, any politics that threaten democracy. But like I said, I don't do simple answers. So if you say any threat to democracy is anti-politics, my question would be, so what's democracy? And I think we can probably agree all on the core values. It's about elections in which everyone's vote counts equally. It's about access to information so you can actually form your opinion. It's about voting in favor of parties and politicians that you like and against proposals and policies that you dislike. It's about the right to demonstrate, the right to protest, the right to a free and fair trial. But if we take a minute, we can probably come up with a whole lot more core fundamental elements. But probably at some point we come across a few that half of you agree with and the other half don't. So does the right to free expression mean that you can insult and ridicule just everyone? Are referendums core to democracy or are they extra? And this is really the problem with anti-democratic politics. It really does depend on what you define as democracy. And we see would-be autocrats around the world using this as a hook to say they are not just anti-democratic. No, they're differently democratic. So tonight, we're going to be pragmatic about this, and I'm going to very undemocratically on my own decide what definition of democracy we're going to use. And our definition of democracy is going to focus on competitive elections, access to information to formulate your opinion, and the ability to express that opinion. Right? For the political scientist nerds among us, this is polyarchy. If you're not a political scientist nerd, forget the term. Just focus on competitive in elections, inclusion of basically everyone, access to information, and the right to express your opinion. So in practice, this means every so often we elect about 150 representatives to a big building where they sit, deliberate, vote on proposals on our behalf. And these 150 representatives, of course, have to adhere to the rules of the game. Competition, inclusion of basically everyone, access to information, right to express yourself. And if those 150 people don't adhere to the rules of the games, that is anti-democratic politics. That is autocratization. And in my research, I focus on a very specific type of anti-democratic politics. And this is called incumbent-led democratic recession. Incumbent-led democratic recession is autocratization, anti-democratic politics, that's being led, being initiated by the ones in power, the leaders, the incumbents. If you take anything away from this mini lecture, and if you're by any chance taking notes, Please write this down. Uh, if there is a big threat to democracy around the world, I would say it is incumbent-led democratic recession. 
around the world, in Europe, and perhaps in the Netherlands. Since about the 2000s, we see autocratization, anti-democratic politics, not only on the fringes of politics, on the fringes of the political spectrum in military coups, but also from within democracies, from within parliaments and by presidents, democratically elected presidents. This does not always result in a complete breakdown of democracy, but far more often in slightly diminished quality of democracy, slightly less open societies, slightly less rule of law. I study this specific type of autocratization, incumbent-led democratic recession, uh, but mainly how to defend against it, the defense of democracy. Now, to give this academic definition a bit more body, we're going to turn to question two, what is happening in Europe? So back to the 1990s. Uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, all the Soviet states became independent and started to democratize. At first, this seemed quite a success story. All the countries organized elections, elected new presidents, new parliaments, and expanded their political and civil rights. Democracy, polyarchy, around the world was on the rise. Great story. Hungary and Poland were often hailed as the success stories of democratization and modernization, and in 2004, they joined the European Union. And conventional wisdom would tell us they will be dead, right? Once in democracy, it would take a crisis like a military coup to revert back to autocracy. But the conventional wisdom did not take into account the likes of Orban in Hungary, Hungary and Kaczynski in Poland. From the hallmarks of democratic success, they became the prime examples, two of the most widely studied cases of incumbent-led democratic recession. So let's discuss very briefly what they did, what Orban and Kaczynski and people like them around the world did to undermine democracy. So remember that we define democracy as competitive elections in which everyone's vote counts basically equally. So when you as an incumbent, as the leader in power, have the option to appoint members of the electoral board that organizes elections, you of course have a heavy responsibility to make sure that that board remains independent and as apolitical as it can get. So, because if you don't, then the area, the space for competition, just becomes that slight bit smaller. So of course, you make sure that there are no political games being played in the electoral board. Unless you don't. Both in Poland and in Hungary, the electoral board, in Dutch the Kiesraad, was packed with loyalists. And this just ever so slightly tilts the balance in favor of the leading party, in favor of Orban's Fidesz, in favor of Kaczynski's Law and Justice Party. And this one action might not mean all that much, but when it is combined with other actions, it starts to add up. So in Hungary, the elect electoral districts were redrawn so that not every vote really counts equally. And you already mentioned the example of the billboards. Outside of the campaign period, uh, campaign messages were disallowed unless it was pro-government because then it was public information. So that's fine, of course. And in Poland, the electoral threshold was raised so that smaller parties could less effectively join in the elections. And when they were able to join, the debates in Parliament were cut short or postponed so that the opposition voices cannot be heard. This starts to add up, and these first instances of autocratization add up to bigger and larger backsliding. Now, before I discuss two other tactics in which incumbent-led democratic recession occurs, I want to emphasize that it's not just Hungary and Poland. It's everywhere in Europe. So, let's look at one of these other cases, Croatia. In Croatia, incumbent-led democratic recession, uh, anti-democratic politics, has been a little bit less pronounced, but it still happened. So at first, government employees were no longer allowed to appear on TV programs, on TV networks that were critical of the government. And you might sort of understand this, right? Because if you're a government employee, you appear to maybe speak on behalf of the state. So if you have any disputes, solve them internally, and don't air the dirty laundry. We might have sort of understand this. But then the leader of the national broadcasting company, the 
uh, the Croatian NOS, basically, was also appointed as a party loyalist. And then critical programs on this public broadcaster were also cancelled. So now we're no longer interfering with elections and parliaments, you know, the strong cores of democracy. We're already a little bit more on the outside, interfering with citizens' access to information. This is still democratic recession, still anti-democratic politics, but you understand it requires already a little bit more nuance, a little bit more explaining before we can say so. Now a third tactic. Incumbents do not always change the rules of the games or do not always manipulate elections, hinder parliaments or limit access to information. Democratic recession can also start really in hidden, opaque and incremental ways. So it can start by calling oppositions treasonous or criminal or criticize the judiciary for being too political, call the media fake or start a debate about what real democracy is or who the real citizens are. But we really get into the muddy waters here. Because of course, politicians should be critical of other politicians. And if the judiciary steps outside of its bounds, of course it needs to be called back. But research has found that these very first instances, these very first breaches in the system can already lead to autocratization. This delegitimation of opponents does not have directly to do with competition, inclusion, freedom of expression, access to information. But it's a lot easier to ban a political party from elections if it's treasonous or to exclude spies from the public debate. So officially everything is fine, but unofficially, under the surface, we can already see these first instances of autocratization. So now you might say, these are all still examples from Eastern Europe, right? Post-communist, whatnot. These countries don't have the strong democratic tradition, the history, the legacy that we in the Netherlands have. But it doesn't just happen in Eastern Europe. From Eastern Europe to the inventors of democracy in Greece, from India and South Korea to the United States, these first instances of autocratization, these tactics, are copy-pasted around the world. And this leads me to ask, question three, how about Dutch democracy? Might that be under threat? Now, disclaimer, um, I'm not here tonight to lecture you about the dangers of the radical left or the dangers of the extreme right. My topic of expertise is incumbent-led democratic recession. And one of the uh, maybe detriments of the field is that we cannot predict the future. We can only look back at what has already happened. So I cannot tell you tonight that the new coalition might harm democracy. I cannot tell you tonight that in two months or so Dutch democracy will break down or that we finally will rank first on any global democracy index. What I can do is look at other countries and see how that resembles what has already happened in the Netherlands. And I think that's why the answer to question two, what's happening elsewhere in Europe, is so important. Because that gives us the information to try and recognize what's going on in the Netherlands and remedy it before it's too late. Now, is Dutch democracy under threat? Um, I am still an academic and I won't give you an easy answer. Instead, I'll give you three answers and you'll have to make up your own mind. Is Dutch democracy under threat? Answer one, no. According to the state of the art, according to any global democracy index measurement or ranking we have, since 20, or up until 2022, Dutch democracy has not seen a substantial decline. Our elections are absolutely free and fair. There are many civil liberties and political rights that are protected by law, and in practice. So this is our baseline. We are doing quite well. Is Dutch democracy under threat? Answer two. Maybe. Amnesty International has signaled that since 2019, the right to demonstrate and protest in the Netherlands has diminished somewhat. And uh, 
Reporters Without Borders ha always publishes a yearly ranking of freedom, press freedom around the world. And in 2022, the, uh, the Netherlands was downgraded from 6th to 28th. We've been upgraded again, but still. And academic freedom has been on the downturn as well. Not because of explicit censorship, new rules or regulations, but more implicitly under the surface. Because of pressures from society, vizier blinks, but also because of pressures from universities on what to publish or what not to say. And then I'm not even talking about distrust, polarization, radicalization and everything. These examples do not, again, directly interfere with democracy. But again, research has shown that, for example, limiting academic freedom and increasing polarization can lead as a precursor to autocratization. And based on what we discussed before, what's happening in other countries, we have to be careful that these first dents in the system do not turn to breaks or full-on breakdowns. Now, answer three. Is Dutch democracy under threat? You might have guessed it. Yes. Autocratization often occurs gradually. And I am hopeful and optimistic that in the Netherlands we will not see a military coup d'etat, the army taking over. We will not see, for the time being, electoral fraud, ballot stuffing. And we will not suddenly see a constitution that limits the right to vote to a privileged class. But when I look at the more subtle manipulations of democracy elsewhere, I do recognize some of that going on in the past few years in the Netherlands. And there's one thing that I want to highlight as a very first instance of this tiny process of autocratization going on in the Netherlands. In a democracy, access to what the government is doing and why it is doing it is vital. And this is not just extra, it's core, front, and center, both so that parliaments can check and balance the executive, but also so that citizens can know what's going on and base their vote on it. In the Netherlands, there are myriad ways to access this information. And one of, one of them is the Open Government Act, the Wet Open Overheid. Officially, government ministries have about 42 days to respond to these information requests. But a study from 2022, and before that the Volkskrant in 2019, has found that on average it doesn't take 42 days. On average it takes 161 days for government ministries to respond to these requests. This is a fourfold extension. Depending on the ministry, it can, about 50 to 90% of all the information requests is taking longer than the legal time frame. And when a decision is reached, Often there are pieces blacked out, for whatever reason, because it was a private consideration of the bureaucrat. <coughs> now I understand that some information is sensitive. And I recognize that some decisions are very difficult. And we all know that bureaucrats do work very hard and very diligently. But from a democratic recession standpoint, from a democratic recession point of view, this first breach of transparency is worrying. I would argue it is similar to the delegitimation of opponents we discussed before. It is too close to democratic recession not to sound the alarm about it. So yes, for me, this breach of transparency is a threat to democracy. To conclude, I need to be very clear that there's many, many steps between where we currently are and autocratization. So that means there are many, many opportunities for us, for you, for me, for journalists, academic, judges and politicians, and again for you and for me, to step up, to step in and to do something about this. We need to defend democracy, because that is what a democracy under threat needs. Vigilant citizens who are critical of politics. Not distrustful, but critical. And we need to recognize, we need to learn from the cases around us and see what is similar and what is different. From where we are standing right now, we cannot see if some actions, proposals or political cultures might lead to autocratization in the future. 
but we can and should recognize if they resemble the starts of autocratization elsewhere. So, are there anti-democratic politics going on in the Netherlands right now that resemble autocratization elsewhere before in Europe? Based on what we discussed tonight, the answer, yes, maybe, or no, I'm going to leave to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for very thought-provoking uh, lectures. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a philosopher, and I'm, I like I like clear concepts, and, um, and and things are still a little bit foggy in my head. F first of all, um, the concept of the rule the rule of law. Uh, the, you had a very rich concept. Uh, which was almost all enc encompassing from free media to uh, w w whatever whatever there was um, and i i was I was wondering um, you mentioned also uh, several uh, political rights, for instance, and I saw an overlap between democracy and rule of law and you you shortly talked about the interconnectedness between democracy and the rule of law but what is the connection exactly that still eludes me maybe a question for both of you maybe you first i i, I do believe in the triangular relationship of uh, democracy the rule of law and fundamental rights yeah. if i may add that yeah um and I do believe that you cannot violate one without actually violating the other two at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are uh, attempts uh, in the European Union to scrutinize one or all three of the values. Actually, there is a tension with this regard. Yeah. The European Parliament back in 2016 uh, tried to come up with a monitoring mechanism for the rule of law, democracy and fundamental rights exactly because of this interrelatedness. Yeah. Uh, but the Commission uh, just hated the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commission instead came up with its own rule of law, but exclusively rule of law mechanism. And this is the annual rule of law report, which yeah. is still a very soft mechanism because it doesn't result in legal consequences or in sanctions. Um, now, because it's very difficult to distinguish these three elements, mm -hmm. even though they are not the same, uh, but they are very closely interrelated, um, we tend to push the Commission, we some some scholars, and I, I, I recently published with Laurent Pesch on this, uh, so we try to push them towards the idea of the European Parliament to have all three values scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Because we, oh, now we have a rule of law report of the European Commission covering media pluralism, covering yeah. corruption. Yeah. These are not necessarily rule of law issues, yeah. but it's very, very difficult to distinguish the three, and it doesn't really make sense. Now, just one very brief um, um, comment on the importance of the difference. For example, when there was a forced retirement of judges in Hungary, right at the beginning of illiberalism, the Commission treated this case as a fundamental rights case, as an age discrimination equality case mm -hmm. of the judges. Mm -hmm. What's the legal remedy in discrimination cases? It's compensation. And this is what eventually happened. The judges got compensation and they had to stay in retirement. Mm -hmm. If it's treated as a rule of law case, then the judges have to yeah, be reinstated. Yeah. Because that this is not a labor law equality dispute mm -hmm. of the judges. Mm -hmm. This is a rule of law issue of society as a whole. That's the difference. Yeah, I get the picture. Any, any comments on this? Yeah, many. <laughs> no, um, so from my perspective, rule of law is, is something more extra on the basic idea of democracy. And I think it's something very worthwhile, but empirically it's very hard to distinguish if it's, if it's a rule of law issue or a democracy issue. So that's why in my talk and many democracy scholars around the world sort of stick to the easy bit, which is elections and right to express yourself, the, the polyarchy, uh, understanding of democracy and that, that we can easily measure and see what's going on around the world. And rule of law is on top of that. 
And then we get into the idea of what liberal democracy is. This is more than just elections, more than just uh, the right to vote and access to information. It's about checks and balances, that governments cannot just do everything. They need to restrain themselves as well. Just because they have a minority, they cannot really change minority rights because they need to be protected as a value in themselves. So when you add these extra bits, which are very important, you extend the definition of, of democracy. You make it already a bigger topic than we already are able to discuss. Mm -hmm. So from a political science standpoint, from an empirical political science standpoint, I stick with the basic, the maybe a minimal, a thinner definition, a thinner understanding of democracy, just to be able to research it. But I completely agree that in very many cases, we see democratic recession, anti-democratic politics, starting in those liberal uh, aspects. They do not start with just getting rid of elections, getting rid of information or uh, plural media. They don't start there. They start on these very soft, on these extra bits. Maybe not have judges not rule on financial topics. Let's just have them rule on whatever is not financial. Mm -hmm. And then you limit the checks and the balances that are there. But you can still say, we're a democracy. We have elections. Other countries have politicized judiciaries. We are a democracy. Yeah. So I recognize that we start often in the liberal dimensions, but I really like to st keep them separate to, to just for my own sake that I can do my research. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, Next question. It's, it's a, again, it's a question for you. Um, so you talked about you had these three answers, um, and one, one, the most interesting one I've, I found was the yes answer, um, uh, where you talked about the the, the right of information um, and the way uh, that in practice, so it's not in theory or in legally, but in practice, it's actually the, the rights not exercised in the, in the, in, in the right way. Um, now, if you compare that to the kind of thing that's happening, the kind of threats to, the real threats to democracy that are happening in the home country of, uh, of PETA, I, I think, well, this is something we can bear. So, so th this is, if, if this is anti-democracy, please give me anti-democracy. Uh, if, that's, if, if that's the only thing that, ha that, that, that happens. How do you see the relation from, do, do you see a slippery slope here? Are we, is this a first sign of something that might happen? Or how do you see that? Yeah. So the big risk here is that you cry wolf, that you give an alarm yeah. when nothing is going on. Yeah. That is the big risk yeah. because if you do it too often, then people will think, oh, he's just a guy who cries about democracy and there are a few like him, but everything is fine. Yeah. It's not like we're in Hungary or wherever. Yeah. So there is a risk in sort of sounding this alarm too quickly. But at this current moment in time, we cannot see if this breach of transparency, the diminishing of democratic norms in society is just an up and down of regular politics, or if it's a first instance of that slippery slope. So I'm very aware of the slippery slope argument and that we should not engage yeah. with it. But at this moment in time, we don't know if it's going to go well of, or if there is actual danger and it might evolve into. Why don't we know that? because I still can't predict the future. Yeah. And we can see many cases where it went wrong. Mm -hmm. But there are also many cases where limiting democratic rights for a short amount of time just went well. And then afterwards we reinstated them and democracy was fine. It's also a matter of politics, what you prioritize and what not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking about the curbing of democ democ democracy, uh, because I can talk I can talk about democracy because you you talk about the interrelatedness between the three concepts of fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Um, you have this paradox, and uh, it was mentioned briefly um, um, uh, about the fact that Orban was originally uh, elected in free and fair elections, wasn't he? Uh, and then he started, his party started, you know, sort of uh, fumbling around with, with the, 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 the whole electoral, uh, electoral process. So you, can't, you can no longer talk about completely free and fair 
uh, elections. But the original point is that we have a democratically elected leader. Um, th this is this is a strange contradiction. It's strange principle that is uh, somehow inherent to to uh, democracy mm -hmm. so is democracy not all fine what and what can we do about it um so yeah what to do about it of course i have to jump back in history because yes. before 2010 between 98 and 2002 uh, there was already a fidesz government yeah. and i think the lesson that orban learned is that he cannot leave any leeway yeah. so all the critics have to be silenced and all yeah. his people have to be embedded in important positions who who must be elected for a very long uh, period of time but you are perfectly right uh, there were free and fair elections back in 2010 yeah. Um, but that um, translated, even though it was a little more than 50% of the votes mm -hmm, cast in favor mm -hmm. of uh, of his party, that translated because of the election laws into a two-third majority. Yeah. And I think this is the distinguishing factor between uh, Hungary and Poland. Hungary had a constitution-making majority. Poland didn't. Mm -hmm. So Hungary could do many, many very fundamental changes that couldn't be undone, uh, could have been undone by the Hungarian Constitutional Court. But as I said, that was the first institution to be captured, to, to be on yeah. the safe side. Yeah. There would have been, legally speaking, one, uh, one possibility, and it's there in some jurisdictions, that some constitutional courts can say, this is an unconstitutional constitutional amendment. You can never do that. For example, in Germany, there is the eternity clause protecting human dignity. So if any parliament in, 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 uh, in Germany would scrap the provision on human dignity, that would be impossible. And the uh, German Federal Constitutional Court would say that's an unconstitutional, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's no yeah. way to go. Uh, but the Hungarian Constitutional Court didn't have this power. So... Basically, once you have a new constitution, once you have a captured constitutional court, that's already a battle half won. Mm -hmm. um, in Poland, at the same time, they had to do everything through the back door because they didn't have a constitution-making yeah. majority. So everything was much more brutal, much more visible, like the government not publishing constitutional tribunal judgments that they didn't like. I mean, yeah. it was a very blatant violation of the rule of law, yeah. um, uh, obviously. But once you have that, you really can always rely on democracy, understanding it, exclusively as the majority rule, yeah. without any constraints of the rule of law. And mm -hmm. that exactly is what a liberal democracy cannot um, allow to happen. It cannot allow, but what can cannot we do? cannot allow because the rule of law constraints are yeah. supposed to yeah. be there. Yeah. In a liberal democracy, and 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 you briefly mentioned uh, you talked about possible measures, possible things we can count, we can we can do, we can do, um, to to counter to counter this. Uh, but it seems that in Europe these 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 possibilities are not really exhausted uh, yet. Uh, so what, according to you, should be done? What 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 exactly should be done to counter this? Um, I have very, very specific suggestions uh, yeah. to the European institutions. When it comes to Article 7, use the sanctioning prong of Article 7, 7.2. So mm -hmm. don't, don't go for the preliminary prong. Can you explain a little bit more? Uh, about so Article, Article 7? 7 has two prongs. The one is a preliminary prong. It just says that there is a potential danger to systemic violations of values. And at the end of the procedure, there is no sanction. It just states that there is a danger. Period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, according to Article Seven, Two, and Three, that's the sanctioning prong of Article Seven. Uh, it's not just a danger of potential value violations, but the violations already happened, and sanctions can be imposed and should mm -hmm. be imposed uh, on the member state in question, including the suspension of the voting rights in the council or taking away some other rights that mm -hmm. are enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty. We don't know what these other rights are. The European and Union could specify. be creative. They don't specify. Yeah. So uh, so that's something for scholars to figure out mm -hmm. uh, at, at, for the time being. So that's Article 7. But it's not very useful politically because you need unanimity without the uh, member state in question to, uh, to pass this judgment. But I would go for infringement procedures. Infringement procedures are... Ex uh, uh, particularly useful, but only if you call a spade a spade. If it's a rule of law violation, say it's a rule of law violation, don't pretend it's a fundamental rights violation mm -hmm. like it happened in the Hungarian judicial retirement case. Also, time matters. Mm -hmm. 
It's very, it's a very important lesson from Poland and Hungary. Time is always on the side of the authoritarians. Just imagine that judicial capture happens. Mm -hmm. The European Union is silent. You have new judges elected in an illegal procedure, mm -hmm. but the new judges will start passing judgments. You cannot undo the whole thing because you create a whole legal chaos. Imagine you get divorced and then it turns out that the judge was uh, appointed in an illegal procedure. Is your divorce now void? You're, you're still married? I mean, you mm -hmm. can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, basically it's irreversible if the damage is already done. Or previously I used to work for the Central European University. That university had to leave Hungary and move to Vienna because of violations of academic freedom. The Commission started an infringement case against Hungary. Hungary lost the case. But it took so long that in the meanwhile, the Central European University was long moved to yeah. Vienna. Yeah. So it, the case was moot. So you really have to act fast, apply interim measures, and a very important thing is follow up. We have plenty of infringement cases actually lost by the governments that are never enforced and that they're not followed up. Mm -hmm. So this would be uh, uh, with regard to infringement cases and as uh, with regard to the power of the purse, um, just use the common provisions regulation, the conditionality regulation, and attach rule of law conditionality to the distribution of funds. Because this is absurd. There's no, no money anymore. Exactly. No money it's, anymore. It, it yeah. might not function with net contributors, yeah. but for the time being, with the with the countries that uh, that that are the uh, uh, the black sheep of the of the European family, we have an absurd situation that governments are building regimes in violation of EU law out of EU money. Yeah. At least don't do that. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about from your perspective, uh, empirical political science perspective on democratic backsliding and, and this paradox that de democratic institutions can actually create anti-democratic leaders uh, and what to do about it? What, what, what is your perspective on that? So there, I think there are two things I want to pick up on what Petra said. Yeah. One is about the, the money from the EU. As soon as the EU stops giving money to Orban, what's the first thing that Orban says? It's again the Western European Union, neo-colonialism, starting to imprint their own ideas of liberalism and democracy on us true ethnic Hungarians. Yeah. And we want to have our own Hungarian Christian democracy, not their liberal Western democracy. And as soon as you take away the money, it might be a very valid legal option and it might work. But the political argument on the side of the would-be autocrat is going to be automatically be they're again infringing on our sovereignty. Again, they're trying to put their picture on our democracy. And to a certain extent, I think that is also a way in which punishing Orban might give him more ammunition to strengthen his autocratic policy. Mm -hmm. So it might be a very legal way, but there are political consequences that we might not oversee. And the same is for um, the the inherit the judges you mentioned. Mm -hmm. If there are judges who are appointed illegally, unconstitutionally, out of bounds, I think afterwards we've reinstated democracy. There's a new democratic leader, but these judges are appointed for life. You cannot just get rid of them. And I think again there might be a very strong legal argument, legal theoretical argument, why you might get rid of these judges because they were initially appointed unconstitutionally. However, I think the political side of this, as soon as you, as the new Democrat, start to immediately abandon, uh, abandon democratic positions and say, all judges are inviolable, except for those people, because those were appointed not according to our standards. As soon as you start to sort of undermine democracy yourself, I think that is already very difficult. But, but what then? So what, what then? else? Yeah. I think one of the main things that politicians, but also democratic defenders in society, you and us, but academics, journalists, um, bureaucrats, at every point in time, they should signal that something is undemocratic. They should always emphasize their own democratic commitment so they build up this democratic trust. And I think then they can sort of later lean on this in a political debate. Because if you are inconsistent in your commitment to democracy, this is the first thing that an autocrat is going to do and say, yeah, you cannot blame me. You've before done 
such and such. So be consistent in your expression in favor of democracy, but also in your behavior in favor of democracy. Can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should. <laughs> <laughs> um, as to the as to the political consequences of withdrawing money, for example, uh, and how it would be interpreted in 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 Budapest or or Warsaw. You are right. The European Union will be scapegoated. They will be blamed for imposing a certain worldview uh, on these two countries. But it's happening anyway, irrespectively of whether you give the money and how much money to give. One of the great enablers of illiberalism was Ursula von der Leyen, who made many, many compromises right from the beginning. And now if you go to the streets of Budapest, it's full with billboard posters saying that we won't dance as Ursula von der Leyen is whistling. She mm. is not, that's that's the exact translation. Uh, she 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 is uh, uh, she is uh, she is our main enemy number one. It it doesn't it doesn't really matter what is happening in Brussels. It will always be blamed and it will be used for internal political games. So this is this is the first point I would like to make. The second is. Uh, the irremovability of judges. Maybe I will just point this out because really judicial independence is the very essence of the rule of law. Yeah. So, and and the very essence of judicial independence is the irremovability of the judges. This is this is why it's so terrible that Hungarian judges, later Polish judges, were removed prematurely. They were forcefully retired from one day to another. Um, but what happens if a judge was appointed, as you say? in an illegal manner. For example, in an ad hominem procedure. We have this in our country. A judge doesn't qualify to the position of the Supreme Court. And a specific tailor-made law is adopted so that from now on, he does qualify. And of course, he's a great government ally. And now he's the Supreme Court judge, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court president, and he has, uh, you know, who, who, who has the power to hire and fire and whatever discipline uh, judges. Mm -hmm. What would you do if there was a, a, a reverse U-turn towards democracy? Mm -hmm. Because these people are there for nine years, for 12 years, for life. Uh, would you remove them or would you not? As I said, it would create a huge mess. But what I also argue is that you cannot have as a clean solution on the way to democracy as we would all like to have. This is now happening in Poland mm -hmm. and too much an emphasis on a formal understanding of legality would make a return to the rule of law, unfortunately impossible. And of course, I see the political connotations. All the current opposition in, in Poland are already saying that you are against the rule of law because you want to change yeah. uh, the situation on the ground. It's going to happen. But you cannot have a crystal clear, clean uh, return to the rule of law that we would all love to have. Now it's uh, your turn. Um, I don't really know how to follow up on this. Okay. So maybe. <laughs> but so the, 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 the so w the, the point the point is that um, if you if you stick to the to the democratic response to un undemocratic um, uh, uh, behavior, um, you might actually end up um, uh, keeping keeping under un the undemocratic or anti democratic elements in the situation upright. Uh, so this this is what what the examples. So this actually contradicts your point that we should always stick to legal democratic means in in, in our opposition to to um, to anti democratic uh, elements. I think it's a very fundamental point. Uh, so could you could you dwell on that? Right. So my point on staying con commitment committed to democracy is really based on what is being used as arguments for autocracy on the other side. Mm -hmm. Because would-be autocrats consistently point to the uh, the detriments of a democratic system. Some mm -hmm. people are, uh, the European Union has more influence in Hungary than Hungarian politics itself. And if we allow new Democrats to sort of reinforce that argumentation, there is still a huge electoral base for anti-democratic parties. They might not be electorally in favor for non-democracy, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
But there's so much else that Fidesz stands for, that the Law and Justice Party stands for, that citizens might be willing to dra trade off democracy in favor of that everything else. Mm -hmm. So if we give more ammunition to that camp by ourselves not sticking to democracy, we might make those other issues more salient, more important, and again, increase that electoral base. So for the current while in government, it might be fine, and we have our own new democratic judges again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have our own democratic pro-European government mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. But when the next election comes, I think this sense of unsatisfaction with not getting stuff done might backfire again. And this is, we don't know what's going to happen, but what we do know is that if you're undemocratic, if you yourself do not show commitment to democracy, they will use it as an argument. And it does resonate with people that you are hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So you should be aware of that and you should not do that yeah. for the next elections, for the one after. Still I, I, I also have a solution like yeah. you, yeah. Uh, because it's a little unfair just to say that legality stands in the way of the restoration of the rule of law. That's yeah. the claim I yeah. basically yeah. made yeah. Uh, without giving you any uh, um, any solution. And I think the solution lies uh, with European institutions, because yeah. uh, this is this is le really lesson number one of European Union law, that European Union law trumps national law. Yeah. So whatever the constitution says, whatever the national law in Poland says, the European Union law, including the European values, must trump yeah. everything that is there. So there, I think that supranational courts, especially the Court of Justice of the EU, mm -hmm. but also the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, could be of help, saying that from now on, this is the rule. The European Court of Human Rights, for example, already held that certain panels of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal are non-courts. Yeah. because the judges are not independent. Yeah. That could help in the restoration of the rule of law, pointing that, well, we have an international obligation to comply. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. even national law. We must do that, right? And second, what standards apply when you return to the rule of law? We have already been there. We tend to forget. In 1989, 1990, we have a huge bulk of Strasbourg case law on transitional democracy. Mm -hmm. For example, back in the 1990s, the Strasbourg court said that in a transitional democracy after communism, you need to give more room to freedom of speech. It's almost unlimited. It's almost an American understanding of freedom of speech, mm -hmm. right? Um, later on, you can limit it with defamation laws, hate, crime, hate speech laws, and so on and so forth. But in a transition, everyone should be able to say what they were yeah. unable to say for decades. So we do have a case law on that. We do have standards. Let's take these tra transitional democracy standards because now we have another transition um, in Poland, but, but, fortunately. But, but, but so what you're implying is that European courts are not doing their best yet at, the, at this point, are they? To some extent they are. So the Strasbourg court, for example, took Does. the lead with regard to yeah. judicial independence. Uh, the Luxembourg court also um, have, has a very useful case law, especially since 19, uh, uh, 2019. It has a very forward-looking case law, but it's not entirely consistent mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, and it's a little lagging behind uh, after uh, the Strasbourg mm -hmm. um, jurisprudence. Of course, it's a very delicate question how far you can stretch the courts to do the job that the political institutions, namely the Commission and the Council, were supposed to do, namely to step up against rule of law yeah. decline. What is happening in the Council, they have, for example, the Council Dialogues. We haven't talked about that. This is a 30-minute dialogue about each member state every three years. It's yeah. a super useless procedure, yeah. right? Yeah. Instead of really stepping up or the Commission not starting infringement proceedings. They are the institutions that also should take responsibility. You cannot shift the whole political responsibility to, to, the, courts. The, to, the, to the judiciary, yeah. which yeah. basically is overburdened mm -hmm. with this weight that they put on them. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Can I jump in? Yeah, you yeah. yeah. Because So I don't want to be like the pessimist and saying democracy is in danger, because I think in general democracy is very resilient. Uh, there are many ways to counter autocratization. But I do wonder if you're saying maybe the big solution in Europe is the EU and EU law. How do you then deal with the legitimacy 
crises of the EU, of EU courts. There are many political parties in the Netherlands suggesting that maybe EU law, international law shouldn't supersede national law. Maybe our democracy is more direct from 18 million inhabitants to 150 representatives instead of to the European Parliament. Mm. So there's a closer connection there. There's more democratic legitimacy in the Netherlands. So how can we say, wait, the solution for democracy in the Netherlands, let's turn to the EU. I think that it, it might work, mm. but I do wonder if it's the best solution in cases where anti-democratic politics are also so often nationalistic politics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now, this is this is the end of the game. It already happened in Poland uh, in a 2021 decision. Uh, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal said that the Polish Constitutional trumps EU law, period. Yeah. Yeah. And in a later decision, they said that the Polish Constitution also trumps the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, that's the end of the international yeah. legal order as we yeah. know it, yeah. because we have actually international laws saying that international laws have, have priority. Yeah. Now, if you question that, then basically the whole system yeah. collapses. Yeah. And I, I, I uh, share your concern, if this was a concern, because this whole system, especially the Strasbourg system, is a very soft system. So, of course, these international co international judges, they don't have an army, they don't have an uh, enforcement. I mean, they do have an enforcement mechanism. But if member states' gentlemen's agreement uh, shatters, then basically there is no one to enforce yeah. Yeah. Uh, meaningfully uh, the judgments of the European Court. So whenever, for example, the UK previously, uh, or Russia, but also Hungary, totally disregard, simply disregarded Strasbourg decisions or Luxembourg decisions, it's not only bad because of the human rights of the individual, but because the whole system is, is, is shattered and yeah. is falling apart. Yeah.